introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, her name is Deb Ellis. She is a master gardener. She is a Rutgers environmental steward. She's an activist for the environment. Um, and she is here tonight to talk to us all about invasive plants, but how to recognize them and how to remove them and how to uh, fill up that space with native plants. So without further ado, I'm going to let Deb take the, the, uh, the screen um, for the next half hour, 40 minutes or so. And then we have some announcements, some, some chapter announcements, and then Deb is going to stay on to answer some. Oh, yeah, this was so good. But here's the my box. new favorite. If everybody could please mute, if everybody could please mute. Um, so that we can hear Deb, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. And before I share my screen, we're gonna do a quick poll because I think I always like to know a little bit about my audience and that's the frustrating thing about Zoom. You can't see people's reactions. So just to gauge a little bit where people are, if you could fill out whether you grow zero to five native plants, six to 15 native plants or more than 16, that would be really helpful. And either body or Kim, you made my poll better. Because I realized later that it wasn't precise enough. So thank you, whoever did that. I think it was Bobby, because she's smiling. So how, did, how are the 80, results? We're 80, per, uh, a couple more are still sneaking in here, 83%. All right, looks like things have stabilized here. We've got 28 of 31 or 26 of 31 people. Okay, good. So you want to tell so, the results? Yeah, the results are, you're going to love this, Deb. 16 or more plants, 56%. Okay. 6 to 15 was 30% and 0 to 5 is 15. So these, okay. are, these are some avid native plant we have some very mostly very knowledgeable people so that's helpful to know so thank you um and thank you all for growing so many native plants so that is very helpful to me um to know so i'm going to now share my screen and as kim mentioned um this is going to be a little interactive um what I'm going to do is about halfway through, I'm going to uh, break to take questions. So I will take some questions halfway through, and then I will also take questions at the end. And at the end, I will be um, glad to do it um, as long as we need to do it. Um, so this is called Replacing Invasive Plants with Native Plants for Wildlife. And the one thing that um, Kim said I was going to talk about that I'm not, so I just want to make sure people are okay with that. Um, I'm not really going to talk so much about removing invasives, which removal of invasives really can be its own 45 to hour lecture. Um, I'm really going to talk about not buying invasives, frankly, not adding to the problem, and what can you buy instead, and then also just so replacing them with native plants for wildlife. So to begin, I really care about our human culture and how our human culture relates to the environment. And I'm very grateful to my parents um, for giving me my love of gardening. And so over here on the left, this is me um, a long time ago, <laughs> 35 years ago, um, with my dad, who's no longer with us, but he's with us in spirit, um, with me in spirit. And then these are some children that came to our um, garden tour for our Native Plant Society in Essex County last year. And uh, they're masked and you can't see their faces. So it's a safe picture to show, but just to show that my ultimate goal for myself and I hope for all of you tonight is to share our love of natives with the younger generation with other people. So to begin with that. And why should we care? So the fact that so many of you grow natives, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm gonna assume that you, most of you know why, but I'm gonna go through it quickly to make sure we're on the same page, that we are living in the midst of a mostly silent 
biodiversity crisis, there's not as much attention to that as there is to the climate crisis, which is they're both really, really severe. And it's literally silent because the world is becoming more silent from bird song and insect song because we are losing so many species. So you can see here some of the most salient losses, the 3 billion decline of birds, so huge in the last 50 years in North America, 90% of monarchs and a huge bee decline. And of course, those are just examples. There's much, much more insect um, decline than that. I also want to make sure we're on the same page about some definitions. So there's three main definitions I use in this talk. One is the a native, and those a native plant. It can be a longer definition, but basically it's something that was in our um, ethos, ecosystem before the colonists came. Um, then there's introduced, but not invasive. An example of that is daffodils. And then there are invasives. Invasives are introduced species from other countries that invade natural areas, crowding out native plants. And we are gonna talk about that a little, um, a little bit tonight. Oops, something happened here with my PowerPoint. I'm not sure what. Um, okay, so I'd like to tell people where I'm going. So um, there's gonna be three main parts of this workshop. I'm gonna talk about why native plants are important briefly, because I know you, the majority of you know that. Um, but I am going to quickly go over it. And then I'm going to talk about why not to buy invasives and what to buy instead. And doing this invasive talk made me realize something I hadn't really realized until I prepared the talk, which is that most invasives are not flowers. Most of them are ground cover shrubs and trees. So I'm going to, when I'm talking about how to replace invasives by buying other things, you're not really going to hear much about flowers. So I'm also going to tell you my top dozen flowers um, that I think are great for natives. So for those of you who are already growing a lot of natives, I hope that you learn something new. I mostly have ones that are pretty common, I think, but there's a few that I hope, I hope everyone gets something out of the workshop. So one of the basic concepts is what is a host plant? Um, a host plant is a plant where caterpillars lay their eggs, um, or where butterflies or moths, sorry, lay their eggs, and then the caterpillars eat the host plant leaves. Um, so some people don't really like the idea of insects in the yards, but we really need to have compassion for the poor insects. They need something to eat as much as we do. And many, many of the butterflies are specialized, meaning that they will only eat the, uh, <coughs> the leaves of certain plants. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, that they have co-evolved with. And I always like, in every talk I do, I talk about violets because it's the state flower of the state I grew up in, Wisconsin, and the state flower of New Jersey, and the state flower of two or three other states. And violets make a great ground cover and they are host plant for the fritillary butterfly and we can eat them ourselves. This is my salad bowl last spring when the violets were blooming and there's also violet leaves in there. You can eat the leaves too. So as I was saying, the problem is that if we don't plant natives, the insects are specialized, many, many of them. And for example, I think most of us know without milkweed, we will have no monarchs. And in fact, 5% of natives host 75% of Lepidoptera, which is a fancy word for butterflies and moths. So in choosing plants that I'm going to present, I'm going to focus on plants that um, are, mo I focus on plants that have a lot of ecological value and many of them are host plants. So, there might be a couple of you, maybe some of them, you in the zero to five category of growing native plants that are wondering about whether you really want insects in your yard. And I want to convince you that insects are so important. With, if we all died, the world would continue if human, if human beings died. But if insects died, the world would not continue because they're the basis of the food web. Um, and caterpillars, of course, become butterflies. We know that. But one thing we don't always know is that they also become songbirds, that 97% of our terrestrial birds feed insects to their young, and that they need incredible amount of caterpillars. I mean, yeah, they feed, they feed six to 9,000 caterpillars in one, um, for one nest. 
here's my hungry birds there. We had birds in our birdhouse and it was so cute, these wrens watching the parents constantly bringing them food. So that's a really reason why we want to have native plants that are host plants. So I know I'm speaking to Hudson County where many people have small yards and sometimes in native plant talks, people talk about meadows and you might think, well, what can I do if I don't have that much space? Well, I don't have a lot of space either, but I do have more space than some of you, but I have a fairly small urban yard. This is my house over here on the left and over there is the, um, my neighbor's house. You can see this uh, is a little part where my sump pump comes out. But the good news is that even small habitats make a big difference. And especially when they're connected with neighbors and towns. And it's wonderful that we have our new Hudson uh, Native Plant Society chapter. So the more that people connect with each other, as Amanda shared in the start of the presentation tonight, the more impact we have. And I just wanted to show you here, this is my health strip in front of my house. Um, and it's only two by seven feet and it has five species in it. So that's what you can do even with a very small, very inhospitable area. Um, and later I'll have a, a slide that shows it from another angle, but here's the black eyed Susans and purple coneflower um, growing in a place where the soil is rocky and salty and it's still thriving. One of the wonderful things about natives as I'm sure many of you know is they frankly need much less care um, Mother Earth was, uh, you know, no one waters the fields, I say no one waters the woods, and we don't have to expend as much care as sometimes people think they have to do in gardening. So since we're going to focus a little bit on vases tonight, um, I want to first think about, well, why are invasives bad? Because sometimes people say, in fact, a very good friend of mine, who I've known for for 45 years, she was my college roommate. She really doesn't get this. She goes, we have to agree to disagree um, because she really sees gardening as only for aesthetics. And as Doug Tallamy, who was kind of the guru of this movement and spoke at our uh, state conference, which Kim and Bobby helped organize a week ago, says that we really have to now think about biodiversity as equally important to aesthetics, I think. But I think we also, as gardeners, want to have aesthetics, right? So invasives are bad because they did not evolve with our creatures, so they don't support the food web. But really they're bad because that's true of daffodils and tulips, which are not so good, but they're not invasive, right? But invasives overrun our natural areas. They're not eaten by deer or other animals. And they have a very high reproductive rate and they're really easy to, they, they grow really easily um, and they're very hard to eradicate. If you're interested in looking up more about um, invasives, this is New Jersey invasive species strike team and they have a list of what not to buy. And I like to use the example of butterfly bush as an invasive plant, it's an emerging invasive um, that is still being sold. And it breaks my heart when I go hiking, because I love to hike, when I go hiking and I see our woods full of barberry, full of um, English ivy, full of other things. And that's going to become true of um, the butterfly bush. The butterfly bush is an emerging invasive and people say, well, I don't see it going to other places other than my yard, but it does. Um, and this was sold, this is a sign from last year at a garden sale in Montclair. I've seen it sold um, at Broken Botanic Garden. So, you know, people go and they don't know. So that's one value of tonight to know that this is, um, yes, the butterflies, it attracts butterflies, but it's also spreading into natural areas and it doesn't have high quality nectar. I listened to a talk by Mike Van Cleff for our Master Gardeners on Saturday morning. He heads up the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, and he said, this is like having a Coca-Cola dispenser for the butterflies. We wouldn't want to do that to our children. We don't want to do that to the insects. So here's some of the common invasives that are still being sold and bought in New Jersey. The English ivy, finca vine, the ground covers, the miscanthus grass, and these shrubs, Japanese barberry, really invasive in our woods, burning bush, butterfly bush, privet hedge, Japanese honeysuckle, and the trees, Norway maple, Japanese maple, calorie pear. A hint is that um, if something is, might be invasive is 
if it has a, another country's name in front of it, right? It, it's not made of them. Now, I wanna say that I myself bought butterfly bush. I bought butterfly bush before I knew 15 years ago. Um, I even gave butterfly bush as a, as a present to people. So this is something where we're all learning and evolving and I don't want to make anyone feel bad if they have butterfly bush, but I want you to consider, consider getting rid of it. Um, I actually got rid of my butterfly bush because we, I live in a flood prone area and it flooded one day and the butterfly bush died. And what's interesting is the native plants didn't die. So mother nature helped me out. I also had, I moved into a property that had Japanese maple and a uh, beautiful Japanese maple. And it was a difficult decision two years ago, but I felt being the head of the native plant society for Essex County that I could not have Japanese maple. So I got the consent of my husband and took it out. And um, my children were upset with me then. I never even knew that they had noticed it, but I'm still happy I did it because I, I have such a small property that the only way I can make room for more natives is to consider taking out some of these invasives and, and some of the introduced plants too. So here are some replacements for the, um, for the, ever, for the ground covers, um, like English ivy, which was all my, my whole ground, my whole property was covered with English ivy when I moved in. Um, and the ferns, if you have a shady spot, ferns are a great ground cover. And, and that's a ground cover that you will find if you go in the woods. It's, um, I know you don't have to worry about deer usually in Hudson County, but it's very deer resistant too. Another thing is the category of sedges. Sedges are almost grass-like and they are um, a lot of sedges. And they, um, and they are carried by some of our native plant nurseries. So that's a really nice ground cover that um, you might wanna consider as replacements for things like English ivy. Here's some more native ground covers because I think people want to have good ground covers. I also think we have a um, aesthetic in our country of too much mulch. I remember talking to one of my favorite nurseries which is in Wisconsin called Prairie Nursery. And he, um, the owner said, you know, we have this aesthetic of uh, bush, mulch, bush, mulch. Um, and in Europe, they much more try to put everything, have the whole garden, the whole area covered with plants. And that's really what my goal always is. I still sometimes use some mulch. But um, I wanted to just give this list of some really great ground covers that are other substitutes between, besides ferns and sedges. And I also happen to have on this slide where they can be purchased. So um, later on, I will give you a list of some native nurseries, but these are some, um, none of them are close to here, to either Essex or Hudson, but um, uh, some of them you can order mail by mail. Here I've highlighted barren strawberry, and that's what the picture is here, because I got this as a giveaway from Mount Cuba in Delaware a few years ago. I actually didn't want it, but they said if you, fill out this questionnaire, we'll give you this plant. I thought, okay, I don't have more room, but I'll take it. Well, I'm really glad I did because that I think is the best ground cover. It grows in sun or shade. It's, I think it prefers shade, but I have put some in the health strip and it's doing fine. It has these beautiful yellow flowers. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And I also wanna hi highlight Virginia strawberry which is not a true strawberry. It's one of the parent plants of, parent plants of the strawberry, um, of the edible one that we're used to. It is sold by Wild Ridge. It, this is, you can see is bare and it has strawberry-like leaves. This one does too. Virginia strawberry is a little more aggressive. It sends out runners like other strawberry plants do. And so, because I have such a small space, I'm always having to cut off the runners and I like barren because it doesn't do that. So that's my little spiel on some great, um, ground cover replacements for the invasive ground covers. Now, butterfly bush is something that I, it's my example kind of of something that's really being sold a lot, even though it's invasive and people are resistant sometimes because they love the fact that it brings butterflies. It does. And it brings a lot of yellow swallowtails. Well, here's my replacement is Joe Pye weed. And by the way, on these slides like this, which are gonna be a lot of my flower slides, there's a lot of data there for you to look at. 
um, take a screenshot or a picture of if you'd like. I'm not going to say every word because it'll be get too long, but I do like to give the data so that if you're newer to this and you want to know how it's going to work in your garden, you have it. In general, I think a lot of natives are tolerant of sun and shade than in species, and same with soil requirements. A little more tolerant of um, degrees of dryness. Some are not, and when they're not, I'm going to highlight that. The Joe Pie wheat is very tall, um, and it was named after it's named after a Native American healer. And you can get smaller cultivars though that are not quite as tall. Um, so it's really a butterfly magnet, just like the butterfly bush. Um, and you'll find a lot of yellow swallowtails on it if you grow it. And another bush that is a little less commonly known for those, so I hope for those of you who grow more and would like to learn something new is this button bush, which I just love these spiky, spiky balls on it. Um, it blooms around the 4th of July. So I sometimes put the, make a 4th of July bouquet with this and red cardinal and red um, monarda and, and my blue non-native um, hydrangeas. So I have red, white, and blue bouquet. And it's very, very good of, um, it's very, very good in wet areas, especially I have it near my sump pump. I have heard it's also very good. It's generally flexible on soil requirements, but I think it may not be good in a really dry area, like maybe not in the hell strip. Um, it's also, although it's called button bush, notice that the size is six to 10 feet. So it actually is almost like a small, tea, a small tree in some ways. And here's a picture of the swallowtail on the button bush that my daughter got. Isn't that a lovely, lovely photo? I just love it. So um, there's a lot of invasive shrubs also like burning bush that are sold. And here's one of my favorite, favorite native shrubs called Virginia Sweet Spire. Um, it blooms in May and it's um, just really, really flexible about a sun and a soil requirement. So if you're starting out and want to try a native bush, I would recommend this one as well as one I'll talk about later called Summer Sweet. Um, and so this is a great nectar source for early butterflies because you always want to make sure you have food for these insects all through the season. And like uh, it's a replacement for burning bush because it has beautiful fall color. So it has that characteristic. Um, and so here's um, are some, just sorry, oopsie. Um, here are some replacements. Um, that are other bushes, uh, inkberry holly, which is evergreen. So sometimes people want an evergreen bush. That's a really nice replacement. And one thing is it does have berries, but you need to have a male and a female for it. Um, sweet pepper bush, I had mentioned, I love that bush. It's another really, really flexible bush in terms of being growing in its uh, sun or shade, wet or dry. I don't have a picture of it. Um, but it's very easy to find. And then this one is a little harder to find. This is for people who are growing more and want something new. It's called New Jersey tea. And New Jersey tea, I like to talk about in New Jersey because it's named for our state. And it's because the colonists use the leaves as a substitute for tea during the boycott of tea in the 1700s. And it just is a magnet for um, insects. It just, I wish I had a picture, but it's almost impossible to capture all the buzzing insects around it when it blooms in late May. This bush wants to not be moved. I tend to move things. I remember my dad saying gardening is moving and I'm always indecisive. This one, you cannot do it. If you move it, you kill it. And it also does not want to have wet feet, but it is flexible about sun or, or semi-shade, not deep shade. Okay, something's happening here. That's not letting me advance. Okay, and then instead of Japanese honeysuckle, you can plant this native honeysuckle with beautiful, beautiful vine. You can see the small area it's planted in next to my house here. Um, and it is a host plant, so I've highlighted that. Uh, it could also be used as a ground cover. You can lay it on the ground and it'd be a great ground cover. And it has this profuse bloom um, in late spring, and then it kind of blooms in what I call pulses. So it's a little bit going on um, almost to, to December, which is amazing. 
So we also have invasive trees um, like Calorie Repair, which is implanted, unfortunately, throughout my town and throughout much of Eastern North America, Eastern United States, and people are realizing it's just terrible. Um, it was actually introduced by botanists at the United States Botanical Garden in DC, not knowing. So that's the thing, we've done all these things without knowing. I think now we are becoming more careful about um, realizing that introducing things from other ecosystems um, may not be the best. But here's some nice small um, trees, if, even if you have a small property that are good replacements for that. Um, the uh, service berry, which is here on the what, um, on the left, which blooms early in the spring. It's called service berry because it blooms when uh, Easter services were when, were when the minister could get through the snow finally to have services to bury the dead. It's also called shad bush because it blooms in the shadow running. It's also called June berry because it has great tasty berries in June, which actually are very high in antioxidants and that we can eat it as well as the birds. And here's our beautiful red bud tree, which is a great little um, uh, flowering tree also. Okay, so um, I am now going to uh, talk about flowers because as I said, there's not really very many invasive flowers that are um, blooming, that are sold, sorry. Most of the invasives are bushes and vines um, and trees. So I'm gonna go through these flowers um, and just wanna show you how I'm gonna go through the seasons. As a gardener, as a native gardener, I think of five seasons from early spring to, to late fall. So that's how it's gonna be organized. But before I do that, I'm gonna take some questions. So I'm gonna stop because I think seasonally is so important. And so that's why I'm doing it rather than alphabetically or some other way or sun or shade. So I, um, really, really like the spring wildflowers. Partly that's what I um, learned with my dad when I was a child. And I just think maybe after our long winters, you know, it's so wonderful to see spring wildflowers because they're a harbinger of the summer coming. So uh, I really like us to think as a society about getting beyond daffodils and tulips, which I know are so prevalent in my town. And there's a big group that gives them out to everyone. So even though I like them, I think they're beautiful, but I think our spring flowers, which are sometimes a little more subtle, are equally beautiful. And two that I really wanna emphasize are Columbine and Golden Alexander. So here's the Columbine. It's really situated for shade, but it'll also grow in park sun. It's just so delicate. Uh, it has nectar uh, for hummingbirds, although I have to say I've never seen hummingbirds on mine, but it supposedly attracts hummingbirds. My hummingbirds come a little bit later, and it's not too large. It's about 12, um, 12 inches. Such a beautiful plant, and it's paired really well with this next plant, if I can get that shit slide to stay, called Golden Alexander. So Golden Alexander, there's two species of Golden Alexander. One is heartleaved, which is Zizia aptra. And by the way, I'm not always saying the scientific names, but I have them there because it is more precise to use the scientific names, especially when you're shopping, to have that with you. For small spaces, and I realize my audience tonight is often have small spaces, the Golden Alexander, the heartleaved, I recommend because it's a little more delicate and less aggressive. So this is a picture of the heartleaved. You can see a little bit the shape of the heart and there's a pollinator visiting it. Um, and you can even try growing this in pots if you um, didn't have much space. So I'm gonna try to indicate that in my slide if it could grow in a, a, a pot. Um, it's a very, it blooms basically um, a good long time from April through June and looks really nice. There's the Hartleaf Golden Alexander with the Columbine. So they're just so beautiful together. Uh, another, um, now getting into, uh, these are only 12 flowers, so we could do a lot more, um, but I'm trying to go through the season. So a little bit later in May and June is this beautiful false indigo, which I think also is notable for the beautiful foliage. So it has a bloom time that's fairly short, actually. It's May into June, but I would say it's only two or three weeks. Um, and the, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting, um, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, 
It is, um, it does not like to be moved. It has a long tap root, although I have moved it once and it's a host plant. And um, I also has a virtue of looking beautiful all, all season long. I think I already said that, sorry. Um, then another plant that blooms about the same time is foxglove beard tongue. And you can see how it's really well suited for bees to get in there. And it's a beautiful, um, uh, I think white is nice in the garden. Sometimes it's just nice um, calming to have a lot of white. It's very good in poor soil. And it could also grow in pots. The, um, the blue um, indigo could not grow in pots. The taproot is too big. Then I always like to talk about milkweeds. And I know as we were gathering tonight, people were talking about it. Um, milkweeds is the, um, I'm sorry. I'm going to just take this person calling me. Amanda, I'm going to call you back. I'm doing a webinar. OK, bye bye. Sorry, that was my law school roommate. I'm doing a party for her tomorrow night and I know why she's calling me. And I decided, okay, she's trying three ways. I got to answer. Anyway, butterfly weed is a beautiful milkweed. I'm going to talk about two, butterfly weed and swamp milkweed. Butterfly weed is um, such a gorgeous orange and is very distinctive for growing in poor soil, but it has to have sun. Um, and it has to have dry. It cannot grow on wet soil. So it's a per this is a border that I saw in um, our town and I got out of my car and took this picture. I thought it was so gorgeous. And of course the milkweeds are important for the monarchs. They're the only host plant for the monarchs. Swamp milkweed is much more flexible. Sometimes if you're just starting out, I tell people the first thing to plant is swamp milkweed because it can grow in sun or shade and wet or dry, contrary to its name. It doesn't need to be in a swamp, but it can be. Um, and you could try growing it in pots. So uh, if you are just starting out, uh, I would really urge that. Purple coneflower is another great mainstay of a native plant garden. Um, it is just beautiful, beautiful color and you can deadhead it. So that's a little gardening tip. Sometimes people say, what does that mean? It means taking off the blooms that are already dead. So if you take it off, since flowers want to reproduce, they'll put up more blooms and then you can even get a longer bloom to season out of it. But it does have a long bloom time and that's one of the factors I use in trying to choose which flowers to present. As native gardeners, we're always planting perennials that are gonna come up every year, but only bloom for part of the season. So it's that's why I'm trying to think about the season and how can we have something blooming at all times. And our state bird, the goldfinch, loves the seeds of um, purple coneflower. And these are, as well as butterflies, love it. So here's the swallowtail. And here is the great spangled fritillary. Um, so this is just an example of if you plant these plants, the butterflies will come. The great spangled fritillary, by the way, its host plant is violets. And I have a little clump of violets in my backyard, as you saw. So I'm thrilled that I have this butterfly in my little backyard. So wild bergamot is, uh, sorry, I don't know why that is. Okay, wild bergamot is a wonderful flower with a nice bloom, this long bloom time in the summer of big attractor of butterflies. It also could be thought of as a replacement actually for butterfly bush because it has the same purple flower. Um, and it's a, a great nectar plant. You can see a silver spotted skipper here on it and um, its leaves and flowers can be used for tea even for us. And here's swallowtails on it. Um, on July 19th, 2019, our, our uh, native plant chapter did a garden tour. It was a really hot day. That's, I remember it was wonderful and we had a lot of butterflies out though. So that's, now, cardinal flower, I absolutely love. I would be hard pressed to pick my absolute favorite native plant because I have so many favorites, like about 100. Um, but I call this a hummingbird magnet because I have seen hummingbirds here every, every summer. We have hummingbirds. We love to sit out in August and uh, sip wine and in our back deck and watch the hummingbirds come to the cardinal flower. It's named actually for the red robes of the Catholic cardinals, not for the bird. And it is a nice burst of red. 
um, in kind of the dog days of summer because it blooms in August um, through September. And I like this flower so much that I've grown in all parts of my little yard. So I've done an experiment and the, I, so I know it grows in sun or shade and wet or dry. Um, it's natural habitat is really moist areas. So if you have a very moist area, it does especially well there and gets really tall. Although it can be grown in pots and it has a sister plant called Lobelia syphilitica because people thought it cured syphilis, it does not. Um, called blue lobelia. For me, I find that to be very aggressive, but it's another beautiful plant too that you might wanna consider. Uh, another big mainstay of a summer garden is tick seed. And for tick seed, um, the species name is Coreopsis and I've just put Coreopsis, Coreopsis species down because there's so many different types and there's so many different sizes, but it's something to consider really for its long bloom time. Look at that bloom time, 90 plus days. So it's a real nice color to have that yellow. Um, and it provides um, nectar and seeds. The bees like these flat disc flowers a lot. Um, so it's something that I think is, I really love that the yellow of this flower. So now we're gonna move to the fall and and with two really important flowers. So Doug Tellamy, as I said in the beginning, talks about keystone plants, the plants that are the most value ecologically to support our insects and therefore support the web of life, support the birds and more. And oak trees are the number one species to do that. And there's some other trees, but I know most of us don't have the space to plant more trees. So I don't normally focus on trees so much. But of the flowering plants, goldenrod and aster are the two highest keystone plants plant, and goldenrod is number one. So I like to tell people about goldenrod. Um, there are, people sometimes think it's um, too aggressive and there are some that are very aggressive. My number one choice for goldenrod is wreath goldenrod, this one here, Solidago casea, um, because it grows in sun or shade and it does not spread very aggressively. Um, I also wanted to mention, since I know some of you might have very small properties, one that is um, very compact is called Little Lemon, but I want to caution that this is a hybrid. And as a native plant society, we are prefer to recommend uh, um, straight species flowers and if or a selection that's naturally found hybrids, this one is even patented, is something we don't like to recommend so much because they are sterile and because they may not have all the ecological function of the straight species. Although the more it resembles the straight species, the better. And the little lemon seems to resemble the straight species well from the pictures. It has the same color. It hasn't changed the color of the leaves. And so if you do have pots and you want to try that, I would recommend it. Otherwise, I have a chart here um, called a goldenrod for every garden because I really do believe there's a goldenrod for everyone. And again, you can see in bold, I put the wreath goldenrod um, because I think it's so perfect if you have a shady spot. Um, but there's really quite a variety and they're just a wonderful addition to the garden. And then with that is New England Aster, the number two keystone plant, um, flower. And this was taken by my colleague um, on our NEDA plant steering committee, Dina Corbin, in her backyard in Newark, which is fairly small also. And they, another thing about the asters and goldenrod is they bloom together. And the yellow and the purple together um, attract more bees because they see that co color contrast. And here's a gardening tip for both goldenrod and asters. They can get very tall and leggy, but if you cut them in half in June, they will then be much um, less floppy. And it's sometimes hard to uh, cut your flowers in half, but it really works. So I wanted to just give you that tip. Some people say cut them on Memorial Day on July 4th. Then you have to remember to do it twice. So I kind of split the difference and cut them in mid-June. So that's, and that's my asters and goldenrod together in my front yard. Um, so, you know, there earlier in the year, there were purple cone flowers here and phlox and coreopsis and there's butterfly weed over here. So somehow it manages, cause I also try not to have any mulch to have this very crowded space with a lot of species and have that sequence of bloom. 
So here's the health strip again, because you may be thinking, can I do this? It would be even a small property. So to remind you, there's that health strip, the view you saw before. And here's the other side of it. This is all going to be asters blooming. Now, I have not talked about deer in this talk, but I have deer that walk down my street and they prune my asters by um, chopping them. And so I don't have to cut them in half, but they still survive. And there's also swamp milkweed down here. Um, so anyway, just so you see the other side of that very small little uh, spot. Here's some tips um, as I'm ending to create and care for native habitats. So I think I've really talked about sequence of bloom a lot. Um, I talked about planting the right plant in the right place, but saying that natives are a lot more flexible too sometimes than our introduced species. You need to water well the first season and then you can let mother nature take care of it. I never water my flowers after the first season and they do fine. I really wanna to emphasize to leave the leaves. Um, I also work in our town um, against leaf blowers for the noise and for ecological reasons. So the leaves are basically free fertilizer and free mulch. We have this racket going where landscapers, at least where I live, charge people to take the leaves away. Then they charge them for fertilizer and mulch in the spring. And if we just imitate mother nature and work with mother nature, it can be a lot easier for us too. And I mentioned before about this soft landings that a lot of insects hibernate in the winter in our leaves. We know the monarchs migrate to Mexico, but where do the rest go? I never really thought about this myself until a couple of years ago. Well, they stay here. Some of them overwinter as butterflies, believe it or not, and others overwinter in cocoons. And so we really want to leave our leaves around our gardens as much as we can. And of course, don't use pesticides. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about some um, ways to buy these plants because I think it can be very challenging in Hudson County and Essex County. I know some of you are from other counties and maybe it's not so challenging, but one thing is we need to advocate with our nurseries. So I've put that little message here. Um, I also want to say there is a great swamp plant sale that our chapter is participating in. So there will be two pickup points in Essex County, which I know is still 30 minutes from Hudson, but it's only 30 minutes. And it's an online plant sale. Um, put the link here that I'm sure Kim will put in the chat for you, and you can email to get more information. It's going to be going from April 1st to April 22nd. The pickups will be Saturday, April 30th from 1 to 4. One will be in my yard, actually, in my driveway, um, and they have 22,000 plugs. Last year was their first year of doing it with 13,000 plugs and they sold out. So this year they're doing 22,000. They have plants in kits as well as um, available for single species sales. So I really wanted to tell you about it if that's helpful for you because it's really hard sometimes to source native plants around here. Also the Great Nursery Toad Shade, which is headed by our president of our society, Randy Eckel, is going to be at the um, Glen Ridge Eco Fair, which is in Essex, in, in Essex County, uh, again, about 30 minutes from you, but I want to just tell you that she's gonna be there because she's normally mail order um, and that might be a nice opportunity and you can pre-order from her. So I just want to alert you to that. And here's some lists of other, um, uh, other uh, native pl places that are exclusively native. There's some that are a uh, mixed and I'm sure Kim can tell you about those too, but I just want to include these that are mostly um, all, that are all native. Uh, I realize that we're getting near the end of the hour, so I don't wanna go into too much detail. Here's some ways to learn more. Of course, our um, website I think is really great, the native plant website. Jersey Friendly Yards I also highly recommend uh, is, um, it has a really good database where you can search for a plant, see if it's native to New Jersey, um, and see all of its requirements. They do include some plants that are not native to New Jersey, but are native and that they recommend. Um, then I want to just tell you about some upcoming events. Most importantly, our Native Plant Society does uh, almost monthly webinars. We're going to take a break in the summer so you can get outside, but um, and they're organized by. Um, Kim from Hudson Chapter, as well as Bobby, who I think is still on. Um, and the next one is gonna be Wednesday, April 27th by um, Kate Brandis and it's called Native Plants with a Small Garden. So I think that's gonna be really great um, for this audience to attend that. 
And then I'm going to do a talk just about um, the spring flowers called Spring Beauties for Biodiversity, if you might be interested um, in at the Livingston Library, which is going to be in person and virtual. So their sign up is there. Um, and that's another free talk if you're interested in learning more about spring flowers. Um, and then I wanted to give you an, uh, also let you know about something we're doing outside. We're going to do a winter walk on the last day of winter this Saturday at 10 o'clock in Brookdale Park in Montclair. And um, there's a morning parking lot there in this near a state, a little stadium where people are, we're gonna gather. And a friend of mine who's a naturalist is gonna take us to her monarch garden that she's created. And we're gonna talk about the um, importance of leaving the leaves and identifying and how we can identify plants even in the winter. I wanna say since um, it's gonna be Saturday that there is a chance of rain on a very high chance of rain and we may postpone it till the next day, which will be at two o'clock that's on Sunday. So we will put that on our Facebook page for Essex County if we um, postpone it till Sunday. We'll make that decision on Thursday, I think. So to conclude, gardening with native flowers is a paradigm shift, but I think it's a lovely paradigm shift to start thinking of ourselves, maybe not as owners of our property, we really, own it for such a short time, I think we should think of ourselves as stewards of our property. Um, and that really to be learning from our plants that nature is our ally and our guide rather than we have to dominate nature, the old way of doing things. And also it means we can spend the less, less uh, money and time gardening and more enjoying. I love it when my husband always says that our backyard is a little paradise. So I think that what we do when we garden with native plants is we create a sanctuary for not, for not only for wildlife, but also for ourselves. And I just wanna end by saying, I really believe that together we can heal mother earth one garden at a time, no matter how small it is. I began with a picture of my dad from a long time ago, and I'm ending with the um, hands of the grandchildren of my colleague, um, Dina Corbin, who I mentioned earlier lives in Newark and she loves to promote native plants. And these are the milkweed seeds in the hands of her grandchildren. So looking 50 years to the future and a special thank you, um, as I said to Marion for doing the schoolyard garden. So I'm gonna conclude there. And I think that um, Kim has some announcements to make and then we will um, take some, I'll be glad to take questions.